Hey guys, um, hope you're doing well. This is our fourth week in the chapter of Hebrews 11. Uh, just a real quick bit of info here. I'm probably going to have to stop at least once when my kids get out of bed and ask for cereal. So that's probably going to happen. Um, it's about 7 in the morning now. And I was awoken at 4.30 by a child with mosquito bites who wanted me to put on some uh, hydrocortisone cream. And I went to lay back down, and my brain was just like, no, you're awake now. So, I don't know if that happens to anyone else, but that's happened to me, and I'm feeling a little bit weird. So, I don't know, I miss seeing you guys in person. I not would have talked about that if we were in person, but talking to a camera on a computer is a little bit different. So, ah, let's soldier on through uh, to the rest of Hebrews, uh, or through the, the fourth week, and there's one more after this in Hebrews 11, and we're just going to go through real quickly here. I don't anticipate that this is going to take forever. I want us to um, to get a good picture of where we are in the book of Hebrews. A lot of times when we move this, this slowly, this methodically through a book, you can lose uh, your vision, you can lose your, your, your grasp on the context. So I, I think it's really important now we look back so that way you know, when we continue through chapter 11, we can keep uh, the proper perspective. So we're going to look back briefly at chapter 10 for a second. And I just want to point out a, a couple of sections here. Uh, faith, which is the main topic of chapter 11, is mentioned three times in chapter 10 uh, before we launch into chapter 11. So looking at chapter 10, verse 21 into 22, it says, Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. So, why am I reading that? Because as we explore this chapter on faith, it's important to know what faith brings. And the author tells us the, uh, in, in chapter 10 that faith brings assurance. So what is assurance? Assurance is knowing, beyond the shadow of, doubt, of a doubt, that we're saved. Knowing that our sins are forgiven, and that God has justified us, and is making us holy day by day. Um, the author of Hebrews refers to this process when he says that our hearts are sprinkled, uh, and that our consciences are cleaned. And that work is done by the blood of Christ, that, that his one and only and final sacrifice from now, for all time, for all people. And what it does is it changes the inward man. The second that the, the new covenant, this better covenant, is about how God will write his law on our hearts and it will, it will completely change the way that everything's been done in the past. And he does this, and he, he the author uh, symbolizes this with this phrase that it uh, our, our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. We're sprinkled by the blood of Christ, and so the inward man has changed. And it says that our bodies are washed with pure water. This is usually typified or symbolizes uh, cleaning the outward man, cleaning um, the way we live. It gives us an ability to live a holy life. So when we are assured uh, of our salvation, when we, are, when we can live in assurance, we can live knowing that our consciences are clean, our hearts are changed, and we have an ability given to us by the Holy Spirit to live a holy life. So, you know, if faith brings this assurance, you know, what does it look like? How, how, how does this happen? How does, how does faith bring assurance? Um, there's an author and a speaker, and his name is John Bloom, and he says it like this. Our assurance of salvation does not come from a confidence in some subjectively measured inner witness, nor how warm our affections for God are at any given moment. I'm going to pause there. That's really huge. Because a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I'm super holy all the time. I don't feel like I am constantly um, overcoming everything and living in this, you know, victorious power of the blood every day of my life. It just, I don't feel that way. But it's important to recognize that our feelings don't always tell us the truth. They don't paint the full picture. And, uh, and that our assurance does not lie in how we feel at that moment. 
rather, uh, John Bloom continues, our assurance comes from a growing confidence in Christ's saving work that purchased the fulfillment of all his great promises to us and his power to keep them. Greater assurance comes through stronger faith, and faith only grows stronger through the vigorous exercise of testing. Now, we're going to follow that line there, that faith only grows stronger through the vigorous exercise of testing. We have uh, seen mentions of this group of people, this group of Hebrews that were written to being tested, being tempted to fall away from Christ, being tested with persecution. And in fact, those verses follow a little bit later in chapter 10, um, actually right before the next couple of mentions of faith that close out the chapter. So let's look at chapter 10, verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were being so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Um, and you can, you know, I've, I've talked about it before, uh, the, the metaphor or the picture, the word picture of painting with a paintbrush and you go up the wall and down the wall and then your next stroke up covers area that you've already covered, but not completely. The author is doing that here when he talks about how don't throw away your confidence, it will be richly rewarded. Phil just talked about it last week. You know, you can't please God unless you have faith and and you you have to believe that God um, sees us as real and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So there's this idea of being richly rewarded for persevering in the faith, be richly rewarded for believing that God is real and that he rewards us. That's a quick aside. So back to chapter 10. Uh, verse 35, so do not do not throw away your confidence that will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For, in quotations, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And in verse 38, and, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. The author of Hebrews knows the trials that this church has been through. He sees what's on the horizon, that this is not going to get better. This is going to get worse. And he sets out to do in chapter 11 what he calls his readers to do in chapter 10, uh, specifically in verses 24 and 25. Go back and look them out. He wants to encourage these people. He wants to encourage them and spur them on to persevere in the faith, to lift each other up, to continue to gather, to grow stronger together in the midst of this difficult time. Well, how, how does this author set out to encourage these people? How does he accomplish this? He starts with reminding them um, of what those who live by faith do and what those who don't live by faith do. If a person has no faith, they shrink back at the time of testing. I've said it just there, that God takes no pleasure in those who shrink back. The righteous will live by faith. So if the person who has no faith shrinks back, the person who has faith steps out, steps out in that faith. They rely on God. They will be saved. They will be rewarded. They will have the full assurance of salvation that faith brings. And that full assurance is a comfort. It is a comfort. I mean, when, I, when I'm having a bad day, my anger or my, my lust or, or my depression or anxiety or, or whatever is gripping me, whatever failed portion of my flesh that is hanging around that day is, is just latched on. What an encouragement it is that through tested faith and tried faith, we have an assurance that we are saved, 
that even though we are not perfect, even though we still struggle, our salvation is secure in Christ. And that salvation is assured, and we can live in that assurance. We can live in that comfort. So the author of Hebrews is just trying to launch into this encouragement, and he's trying to take it to like the next stratosphere. He is trying to really push these people up at the beginning of chapter 11, when he begins to break down what faith is and what it's looked like throughout the history of these people. These people are Hebrews. They know who Abraham is. They know who Isaac, Jacob, Esau, um, Esau's not a good person. Uh, they know who all these people are. Moses, Rahab, Joshua, who fought the Battle of Jericho. We're going to get to that. We're going to sing the song. It's going to be awesome. All of these people, they know who these people are. And so the author intentionally begins to launch into these stories as a method of encouragement. It is so much easier to have faith when you see what faith does and how it's been rewarded in the lives of people who have gone before you. Uh, there was a pastor named John Newton. He was an Anglican preacher from the 1700s, uh, famous for the authorship of the song Amazing Grace. And he wrote about assurance that faith brings. Assurance grows by repeated conflict, by our repeated experimental proof of the Lord's power and goodness to save. When we have been brought very low and helped, sorely wounded and healed, cast down and raised again, have given up all hope and have been suddenly snatched from danger and placed in safety. And when these things have been repeated to us and in us a thousand times over, we begin to learn to trust simply to the word and power of God beyond and against appearances. And this trust, when habitual and strong, bears the name of assurance, for even assurance has degrees. This idea that assurance builds and grows as our faith is tested, as we are cast down and raised up over and over and over again. Uh, and chapter 11 is all about this idea of being cast down and lifted up and how people who were brought low stepped out in faith and were helped. It's an example after example of God's faithfulness to the faithful. It's an encouragement to a church who has been cast down uh, that, that if they remain faithful, if they persevere, they will be raised up again. So let's look at, at this week's text. In, in my section, there are eight different little vignettes, little stories, little bits and pieces that we can dive into. <clears throat> Each one could take a week. There are pages upon pages, books upon books, written about each of these people, each of these stories, and we just don't have the time to really get in depth on any one of them. So I've just got a little bit on each one. It's on you to go further. I hope you do. Um, these are just incredible stories and will really help um, strengthen your faith as these people, these Hebrews who heard them and knew these stories, were able to see what God had done, see the position these people were in, and see how God worked through them to accomplish his will and uh, fulfill his promises. So, Hebrews eleven seventeen, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Abraham was given a promise that his descendants would be a mighty nation, countless in number. They would fill the whole earth, they would bless the whole earth. And he had to wait years and years to see that promise begin to be fulfilled. He was over 100, and Sarah was over 90 when they had Isaac. Uh, a paragraph before, the Bible says that Abraham was as good as dead. Like he was an old man. And don't let pastors and preachers say, oh, people lived older back then, it wasn't as big of a deal. Over and over and over again, the Bible says that Abraham and Sarah were old. Really old. Old enough that they shouldn't be having no babies. And God does this, does the miraculous 
and brings them Isaac. Um, God continually promises that they're going to conceive, and both Abraham and Sarah laugh at different points during the story. They just, this is not going to happen. This just can't happen. I'm, we're old. Uh, so it's fitting that the boy should be named Isaac, meaning he laughs, because God had the last laugh. How wonderful is that story? How beautiful. Uh, how tied up in a bow, right? Because it, it ends there. It has to. That's perfect. You know, and the, the descendants multiply and not so much. There's a lot more to that story. When Abraham saw the fulfillment of Isaac, saw the fulfillment, the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise in Isaac, it was one baby, but that baby was a miracle. And in that baby, a lot of Abraham's hope could have begun to rest. Um, Abraham could have fallen in love with the promise of God instead of falling in love with God himself. And God needed to test Abraham, not so that God could find out the truth about Abraham. God knows everything. But so Abraham could know the truth about Abraham and what was really in his heart and who was really in charge of his heart. Abraham needed to know that he loved God for who God is, not for the promises and the blessings that God brings. So God called out to Abraham. Uh, he, he basically, Abraham, where are you? And Abraham responds with, here I am. It can also be translated as ready. Abraham says, ready, what do you want? Where are we going? What do you want to do? Let's do it. And he is just so eager to fulfill the command of God. And then God gives Abraham this horrific command to offer Isaac the fulfillment of the promise, right? As a sacrifice. But you know what Abraham didn't do? He didn't delay. I'm sure it was agonizing. I can't even imagine. I, I don't know how to process that. Um, but it doesn't say Abraham waited six years, seven years, six hours, seven hours. It just says he rose early in the morning and he began this agonizing trip with his servants and with Isaac. Abraham's faith relied on reason, though. It wasn't just some blind faith like, okay, I'm going to go do this, and, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. It says here, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So Abraham is so believing, so full of faith, promise that God has given him that he will build a mighty nation through his son Isaac that even if Abraham were to sacrifice Isaac to the Lord God was going to bring him back God was going to resurrect him from the dead God was going to do something miraculous and when faith stirred in Abraham's heart the sacrifice was already done Isaac was already killed in Abraham's heart. It was already given up. It was already he was already laid down before the Lord, saying, "Okay, here he is. We're, you know, he's yours, and we're going to do this." And before the physical act was completed, God stops Abraham and provides another sacrifice. And Abraham is resolute in this faith, and he is faithful um, to what God has promised him. And his faith is just shown to be incredible and strong and and enduring. And it, it, it does not give out. It does not give way. So let's move to the next story. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Isaac was initially duped into blessing Jacob. Remember the story Esau sold his birthright, uh, the right to be blessed as the firstborn to his younger brother Jacob. Uh, Jacob then fooled his aging father into bestowing that blessing. But later on in the story, knowing that his blessing was sure, uh, Isaac had faith that God was going to carry out the initial blessing on, on Jacob. He intentionally blessed Jacob. In his old age, in his um, final, final days, he was dying. He intentionally blessed Jacob because he believed that God would fulfill um, would fulfill the blessing, would fulfill what he had said in the past. Um, by faith, verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons, 
and, wor uh, and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. So Jacob, when he was dying, he's leaning on the top of the staff. He can't stand. He's very old. Um, blesses Joseph's sons. So Jacob tells Joseph to bring his sons. He wants to claim them as his own. He wants to give them uh, part of his inheritance, which uh, isn't all that common that the grandfather would do that to the grandsons. Uh, but he does it here. Um, and go and read the story, and it will <clears throat> help you see why this is a, an act of faith. Uh, in this culture, the right hand bestowed the greater blessing. And the eldest son got the right hand blessing, got the biggest blessing. Uh, when Jacob called for Joseph to bring his sons, Joseph put his oldest son in front of Jacob's right hand. And he put his younger son in front of Jacob's left hand. So Jacob stood to bless the boys, and he, following the command of God, crossed his hands. And he put his right hand on the youngest, and his, right, and his uh, left hand, the lesser blessing, on the oldest. And what it does is that breaks the convention of man. It breaks this tradition um, that, that these people believed in, that had been part of their lives as, as far back as they could remember. But... By faith, Jacob believed that God would bless whom God would bless, and he needed to be on board with what God told him to do. By faith, in his, in his dying days, he went against the tradition of man and blessed who God told him to bless. By faith, Joseph, verse 22, uh, when, he in, uh, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Joseph was sold out of his family into slavery at about age 17, and he died in Egypt at about age 110. That's a lot of space. Um, but at the time of his death, he looked ahead. He looked ahead. And we're going to talk about it. Faith anticipates. He looked ahead and believed that God would deliver his people. God would deliver the Israelites from Egypt, out of slavery, into the promised land. And uh, he told his descendants to make sure they didn't leave him behind. Faith looks forward. Faith sees what is not yet, what is invisible, and it leans into it. If we look at all these patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, we can see the faith they exerted at the end of their lives. They were each imperfect. Abraham lied about who Sarah was to save his own skin. Jacob deceived his family. These were not perfect people, but their lives wound down. They looked at what is unseen and fully convinced of what God had uh, promised, and they had faith, and they leaned into that promise, and they believed that God was faithful, that they believed that God was worthy of that faith, was worthy uh, to bear that faith. So let's move forward to, to, to verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Hi. By faith, Mo Hi, Hi, honey. What's mine? I don't know. I'm recording a class for Uncle Phil in Hebrews, okay? Can I watch? You want to watch? Yeah. Okay. Real quick, okay? And we'll go get cereal here in a minute, okay? Okay. Okay. By faith... Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child. They were not afraid of the king's edict. So, that's important here. Uh, Moses' parents hid Moses because that's wisdom. Because the Egyptians, or, uh, yeah, the Egyptians were going to kill Moses. But they weren't afraid of the king's edict because the edict was that if they didn't kill Moses, the king was going to kill them. They said, we're going to hide our son and we're going to protect him. But we're going to do it out of wisdom. We're not afraid that you're going to kill us. They had faith uh, to hide uh, Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, but he persevered, 
because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, and so the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, and when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. So let's look at the faith that was interwoven in Moses' life. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He was the greatest prophet in all of the history of Israel. Uh, we, spend, we spent weeks earlier in this uh, semester talking about how great Moses was and how, how highly uh, these people held uh, Moses, the, the, just the regard that they gave to him. Uh, but here we see how faith worked itself out in his life. By faith, Moses was preserved as a baby. By faith, Moses identified with an oppressed people instead of the riches of Egypt. His faith anticipated Christ as the most valuable treasure. We don't have time to dive into this, this phraseology here, but go back, do yourself a favor, go back and look at the miraculous anticipation of faith when Hebrews in 26 says that Moses, all the way back in history, regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ, who had not come and was not going to come for a very long time, to be greater than all of the temporal treasures of Egypt that were right before him, that were like right in his face. He could have anything he wanted, but he chose what was ahead of him, this eternal treasure, this forever treasure that he had only heard of, that he had only felt of, that his faith informed him of, but that he had never felt. He had never seen. He had never touched. Go back and check that out. By faith, Moses identified with his oppressed people. By faith, he left Egypt. He left this place that he loved, that he uh, that he lived in, that he had um, connections to. And he lived on the back side of the desert for 40 years while God prepared him to be the deliverer. By faith, they followed the strange instructions that would soon be called the Passover, and so they were saved. By faith, Moses delivered an unbelieving people from Egypt by the, by the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. So these two miracles here I want to look at. The Passover. It never happened before. They were following, they, they were following a costly set of rules to, to kill an unblemished lamb and to wipe its blood over your doorposts so that you would protect your firstborn, the firstborn of all of Israel. There were a lot of other regulations that they were instructed how to eat, how to behave, how, what, how to feel, how to anticipate what was going to happen. Uh, and they did it all by faith. By, it had never happened before. This was the instituting of the Passover. And by faith they did it, and by faith their firstborn sons were spared. By faith, Moses delivered this unbelieving people from Egypt by the miracle of the Red Sea. The people themselves, Israel, complained the whole time. Like we had talked about it. It wasn't even a month, and they were already bickering and fighting and you know, saying, you know, you brought us out here to die. And Moses drugged these people through the Red Sea on dry land. And it, it it didn't really jog in the Israelites' faith. Their faith faded pretty quickly. Um, but by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land. It wasn't necessarily this enduring faith that we see all throughout here, but the faith that Moses had uh, in, this, in this time, lifting up the staff that God had commanded him to lift up and doing what God had commanded him to do and leading these people forward. This, this massive deliverance, this exodus began uh, by faith. So, verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell, and the army marched around them for seven days. The people of Israel, led by Joshua, came to the citadel of Jericho. Huge walls, you know, a massive army. Um, but, as we'll learn, uh, this army had already heard of what God was doing to the people of Israel and were very afraid and had no heart. So they were hiding behind these walls. Uh, so 
So what do you do to a city that's walled and you don't have a way to scale these walls or weapons to really fight with or really anything to do? Well, God told the people, hey, bring out the band. Bring out the priests. Take the Ark of the Covenant. Put on some comfy walking shoes and have a parade around the walls of this guarded city. So these people marched around the wall 13 times over seven days. Once a day for the first six days and then seven times on the seventh day. And then what did they do? They blew the horns. They shouted as loud as they could, this whole huge assembly. And it had to have raised a mighty, mighty sound. And what happened? The walls came a-tumbling down by faith, by faith. Faith moves. Faith empowers us. What did Phil say last week? Faith empowers us to do the absurd. And this was absurd. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed uh, with those who were disobedient. I'm not going to go real deep in the story, but there's a few bits that I want to say here. A woman is listed in the Hall of Faith who is not just a woman, but a prostitute. This is a little bit jarring in our context, much less their context, in which case it would have been like mouth agape, um, massively huge for them to really focus on Rahab. Just like it is today, in these times, most women didn't start out in this position as a prostitute. Uh, they, they didn't, you know, as young girls, look up to the stars and say, I hope one day I get to be a prostitute. No, that's not how it happens. Something, somewhere, goes awry. We don't know what. We don't know why. We don't know how it happened to Rahab. But in this moment... And in, in, in this time, Rahab is and was a prostitute, but God, and that is like the best phrase ever, but God can and does activate faith in anyone he chooses. Faith is a gift of God. God activates faith, and by faith, you know, we are saved by grace through faith. So, there is this faith that is activated in us. There is this faith that God gives us as a gift. And what it does is it opens our eyes to the true reality of grace that God has poured out for us. And in doing so, in recognizing this grace, we are saved. Not through our own actions. Not through anything that we've done. Not through, not through, not, not through our own merits, but through the one and only sacrifice of Christ, through this grace we have been saved. By grace we have been saved, but that grace is through faith. This faith activated in us opens our eyes to this grace. So we see that God takes a woman who is a prostitute and they, he activates this faith in her. That's just a big deal to me. I, it just it just resonates in me so much that that he gives Rahab this gift. She doesn't earn it. She doesn't deserve it. She's not, you know, some high. She is lowly. She hid the spies who came from Israel to scope out the land of Jericho, and in doing so, she and her family were saved. That faith not only landed her in the Hall of Fame, uh, the Hall of Faith, you know, out of chapter eleven, but it also landed her in the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus, she's in his line. She is recorded as, as a family member of Jesus. That is a big deal. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter where we are, where we've been. God will do great things for the faithful because he is faithful. If we step out in faith, he is faithful. He is worthy of that faith. He is able to bear up that faith, to hold up all of the things that we have um, need of. He is able to, to meet and to exceed everything he has promised, to, to come through for us. He is able to do that. So when we see here, I'm, and I'm at the end, when we see here about faith, faith moves forward. 
it sees the faithfulness of God, this worthiness to be relied on, and it steps out. Faith sees the promises of God and anticipates their fulfillment. Faith perseveres to the end of our lives, and it carries us through. So we can look ahead to chapter 12, just briefly here. I don't want to step on anyone's toes, whoever's ended up doing chapter 12. We can look ahead to chapter 12, and the author begins to coalesce. He begins to, to bring together the truths that we see in these different passages in chapter 10 and chapter 11. And he does it with this incredible exhortation. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. That's chapter 11. We are surrounded by these stories, these examples of God fulfilling his promises to the faithful. That, as John Newton said, that when we are continually brought low to be lifted up again, that that this, this testing of our faith produces assurance in that we, um, we will be rewarded as we persevere in this faith. So we are surrounded by all of these stories of, of, of the faithfulness of God. It's not just men and women stamping out in faith. It's that God is faithful to reward that and to lift them up, to save them, to accomplish his will in their lives. Um, these stories are meant to encourage and to embolden a people who are persecuted and had more persecution on the horizon, as we're going to continue to read in the book of Hebrews. These people were tempted to leave the hope they found in Jesus to pursue the dead traditions that Jesus left in his wake, these traditions of, of old Judaism. These stories were meant to show uh, that, that people, these great people of their history, uh, and, and, and these great people of their tradition, that they looked forward through time and by faith saw a promise fulfilled in Jesus, and that this Hebrew church was now seeing, has now seen Christ, they can do the same. You know, Moses never saw Jesus. Moses never saw the fulfillment of the entire promise, this new covenant. Abraham never saw the new covenant. Abraham never saw his line grow into a mighty nation. He saw Isaac. That's all he saw. Just a little pinhole, a little bit, a little bit of light. Moses died in the wilderness, didn't even see the promised land. It was just a little bit that they saw. But the faith in them looked forward and anticipated its completion, its fulfillment in Jesus. So, where do we follow? Where do we, where do we go from here? Continue looking in chapter 12. Verse 1 continues, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out to, for us. That's the continuation of chapter 10. That's him going back to saying, Persevere. Don't shrink back. Don't lose heart. You know, Keep going. God will reward your faith. Be one who is righteous, who lives by faith. Don't shrink back. In the, faith, in the face of the trials and temptations that you're facing, in the face of this persecution, don't shrink back. Lean into it. Step forward. Believe that God will reward you. Believe that God is with you, even if you don't see it. Even if, like Moses, you die before the, the fulfillment of all of these promises. You die. You can know, you have seen the Christ, you have seen what he has done, and you can know that the final fulfillment, uh, us being with him forever and ever, is and will be. It's, 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 it's here now, but it's not yet. You can know that he is faithful to do what he says he'll do. Uh, verse 2 of chapter 12 says that we can fix, that we should be fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the protector the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. We run with perseverance. And that God will reward our faith, that we should not shrink back. But where does this faith come from? Um, where does it come from in the face of trials? It comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus, just like these people did. So in 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly or we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I want to read for you real quick something that I don't have pulled up, so I'm going to be looking down a bit. But I hope you have heard um, an old hymnal. Uh, it's an old hymn. It's called uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And it, uh, it goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior, and a life more abundant and free. Though death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. O'er us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. His word shall not fail you. He promised, believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. I want to read that part again because that's awesome and you should read this hymn a lot. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full at his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Hebrews. We thank you for the truth that lies therein. We ask, God, that you would give us the gift of faith and that faith you would grow our assurance so that we would know that you are with us and that you have changed us. We pray, God, that you would test our faith so that our faith would become strong. We pray, God, that we would look to you in all things, that our faith would move us forward, that we would lean into hard times knowing that you are with us. We pray, God, that you would help us to, by faith, anticipate the fulfillment of your promises and know that we can step out and rely on you, that you will reward us, that you will guide us, that you will keep us and protect us, that even when we are brought low in this world, even when the temporary things, the, the, the momentary circumstances look bleak, God, that even for a moment in this time, these afflictions are momentary and light, knowing that forever our home is with you, forever uh, this eternal kingdom uh, lies on the other side of, of this life. We trust you, we believe in you, we know that you are good, uh, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I miss you, I love you, I hope you are well, uh, and I, uh, I can't wait to see you again. Have a great week.